Hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar entitled Green Solvents, Design, Selection and Commercial Use. My name is Laura Hoke and I'm a Technical Fellow here at the Green Chemistry and Commerce Council. For those of you that are not familiar with the GC3, I just want to give you a little bit of background about who we are and what we do. So the GC3 is a cross-sectoral business-to-business network of over 120 companies and other organizations. Uh, we were founded in 2005, and our core mission as an organization is to collaboratively advance green chemistry across sectors and supply chains. Um, so this is just an example of uh, some of the member companies that we work with. Uh, so you can see here um, from all the logos, this is by no means an exhaustive list, uh, but you can see here that um, you know we work with uh, a variety of different companies from uh, multiple points throughout the, the value chain, so from chemical manufacturers to retailers to brands, um, you know, to, to many others. And uh, we're really grateful for all of these voices um, and companies and organizations that do come to the table to work with us as we try to mainstream green chemistry. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of background about today's speaker. So we're very lucky to have uh, Carlos Estevez, um, who is the co-founder and vice president of R&D at Inchemia. Um, his research at Enchemia has been strongly focused on green chemistry, in particular the design of safer and more environmentally benign functional products. This includes the design of safer solvents for a variety of industrial applications, which we've asked him to speak about today. Um, so I just want to say thank you to Carlos for joining us uh, to talk about his company's unique approach to finding safer alternative solvents. Um, so we're really excited to hear Carlos speak. Before we begin, uh, there are a few ground rules I just want to bring to your attention. Uh, due to the number of participants in the webinar, all lines will be muted. If you have a question or comment, please type it into the questions box that's located on the control panel uh, to the right of your screen. And then we'll have a question and answer session um, at the end of the presentation. So with that, I would like to turn the controls over to Carlos uh, to tell us more about his work. So Carlos. Thank you very much, Laura, and, and welcome to you, everybody. Um, let me start saying the green chemist stream is a world economy driven by non-hazardous chemicals that preserve the environment and its natural state. It's an exquisite dream, and I hope to persuade you that such economy can be gradually attained and I want to thank uh, GC3 and uh, in particular Laura Hawk for giving us the opportunity to share with you our vision and to explain some examples of solvent replacement initiatives um, that are of industrial relevance. To drive the economy with green chemicals means fulfilling all the functions existing in the economy. A function in the economy context is a desired effect that brings a property or creates a necessary condition to goods, the environment, or people. So this is how we understand a function in economy. For example, refrigeration. It's the function that accomplishes food conservation uh, is enabled by chemicals such, such as chlorofluorocarbons. Another function uh, would be crop protection. Um, crop protection is possible through the use of agrochemicals. Pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, and other products. Uh, surface protection against ambient degradation could be another important function of the economy. We use paints, varnishes, and other coatings for, for protecting wood, metals, plastics. Um, lubrication, for example, is needed to minimize friction and wear. And in the cosmetic field, uh, one known, uh, very known function is, for instance, a skin, skin protection against UV light, right? So, I leave now the concept of function for a while to address another central concept in green chemistry. And it's, it's what we understand by a green, a green chemical in the context of industrial application. 
since chemicals in economy perform functions, as we have already seen, any chemical, including green chemicals, should display the desired level of performance and functionality, at least in one function. I think we can all agree on that. Um, and I know the, the definitions is, is something always tricky in science and technology. Uh, but, um, but we have adopted as a general definition, the one given by our, by our colleague, uh, Dr. Paul Anastas, who is professor of green chemistry at Yale University. He says, a green chemical is one that provides higher performance or equal performance and functionality while being more environmentally benign through, throughout the entire life cycle. So this approach uh, was codified in, in the famous 12 principles of green chemistry, which provide a framework and, and for innovation and design. But uh, we as, as green chemists, practitioners in laboratories, we need a more operational definition when, when we think, you know, an application chemist trying to find an optimal green chemical substitute or replacement uh, in, in, in their efforts of developing a product formulation or process. Now, one way to define a green chemical is, is through the use of existing uh, and, and well-known uh, indicators or, or, or parameters uh, that are uh, uh, common uh, for the global chemical community. The global harmonized system is a codification system that informs about the toxicological and safety endpoints of substances. You, you all know, based on, on, on standardized laboratory tests, there are 34 health endpoints, eight environmental impact categories, and uh, around 24 safety parameters. Each one, you know, is, is coded by an H number, and a, a chemical su substance that is labeled with a given H number, then it's characterized by the, by the specific hazard encoded by the H number. The, based on, on global harmonized system codes, um, the, the column model classifies chemicals in five different categories um, from negligible hazard to, to very high hazard. Um, for example, a mild irritant would correspond to the low hazard level. A chemical causing cancer would be a chemical of very high hazard, very high concern. So, here at in chemi green chemicals, the our basic selection criteria uh, allows the use of substances displaying negligible, preferential, negligible or, or low hazard uh, according to the column model. Now, of course, exposure routes and, and risk scenarios matter when it comes to the use of chemicals in economy. So, for example, a substance with auto-ignition hazard could be safely used in, in, in for, example, for instance, a cosmetic application, while it would be dangerous if used in automobiles. Um, so, it, in few occasions, there are conflicts between properties. We may allow for certain compromises between environment, health, safety variables. Um, but uh, uh, our preference is to select and filter only those, that, those chemicals that are negligible or low hazard uh, according to the column model. Uh, there, of course, are other uh, environmental parameters that might not be included in the global harmonized system, possibly the tropospheric ozone potential so we add those uh, environmental health and safety parameters not accounted for by the GHS system as, as additional selection criteria. Now, I would like to introduce a third important notion. 
it's called diversity and in particular chemical diversity to illustrate this concept let me introduce you the Inchemia solvent library so over the past 20 years we have put together uh, an ensemble of, of chemicals with solvent properties it, it contains today more than 300 solvents fulfilling the Inchemia the environmental health safety criteria uh, and, and it's growing um, you may ask why we have created this relatively large ensemble of green chemicals um, what are the defining features and why is it important let me start answering the first question when it comes to green solvents we need to create a minimum diversity in order to enable application chemists and industry to achieve the functional performance of the commercial product she or he is developing. I will come back later to the relationship between diversity and function because I think it intensely matters to green chemistry practitioners. I would like now tell you one thing about the number of chemicals we use in commercial scale. I find it stunning. stunning. The world economy functions with approximately 1,500 solvents. At least this is the number of solvents, the solvent entries you find in the handbook of industrial solvents. So compare this number with the solvents that may theoretically exist, ignoring for the moment synthetic accessibility and economic constraints. Ask, for example, how many isomeric alkanes with 10, carbon, 10 carbons exist? Uh, Morowitz, who studied the origins of life, uh, found that there are 75 isomers. This number rises exponentially to 360,000 for alkanes containing 20 carbon atoms. Make again the computation replacing carbon atoms in the alkane molecular structure by heteroatoms and their combinations. The combinatorial explosion that occurs leads to a massive number of solvent, potentially existing solvent-like chemicals. So probably several orders of magnitude larger than the substances listed in the chemical abstract registry, which is 1.3 times 10 to the eighth power. This, I think, has a profound physical meaning. We can sustain the economy with a subset of chemicals that is grotesquely inferior than the total number of possible chemicals. Therefore, if the library of 1,500 existing industrial solvents has not been assembled by chemists and technologists by selection of the most fitted solvents from a pool containing the complete set of solvent-like molecules that can exist in the universe, then the origin of the non-industrial solvents responds to alternative innovation processes. Certainly, many solvents uh, in the handbook of industrial solvent have come to exist after the discovery of a new synthetic process or reaction. Other solvents came into place by exploring what the theoretical biologist Stuart Kaufman denominates the adjacent possible. For example, the expansion of a class of solvents through the synthesis of structurally chemicals of the homologous series is an example. A significant fraction of the existing solvents were brought to existence by chemical design as well, just to achieve a specific functional performance or cover uh, a gap in the physical chemical parameter space. These are called designer solvents. So we reach now an important conclusion, I think. The emergence of new solvents in the history of chemistry enabled the appearance of new functions and chemicals. New functions prompted the design of novel solvents in turn, and more solvents enriched the context ultimately opening new opportunities for new functions, new chemicals, and new solvents. So solvents and functions have 
uh, in a way co-evolved in common traject traject technological trajectories across different sectors in the economy. I, I ask now three questions. Uh, how can we design libraries if green solvents aim at replacing solvents with undesired environmental health safety properties for its application in well-established functions? In particular, what should be the size of that library? What should be the optimal diversity of such library? My second question is, is can a library of green chemicals have any important role to satisfy the complex functional requirements of industrial products and processes? And the third question is, can such a library actually come to exist at all? Now, to the best of my knowledge, there is no law or theory in physics or chemistry that can give us an answer to these very deep questions. My goal here is to bring to your attention what it can constitute the starting point of a body of knowledge that will help us understand this uh, very fundamental questions. I will present now the Inchemia Solvent Library and later I will show how we have used it in, in a number of case studies. So the, the Inchemia Solvent Library is, is composed of uh, 300, uh, more than 300 pure solvent candidates. Uh, there are existing commercially available solvents. There are novel solvents uh, never used in an in industry at large scale. Um, uh, of the total uh, number of solvents, uh, so we have uh, we have measured um, and predicted um, many properties. Um, uh, we have uh, also measured experimentally or predicted using um, computational algorithms. Uh, there are, so we, we have assured uh, the, the desired diversity by, by using uh, more than 30 building blocks or, or chemotypes, and we have built uh, variants uh, uh, around these building blocks. Now, now, this is the very basic uh, information on, on the library. Um, so let me, let me say about the, uh, the molecular structure of its constituents. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, the library has been optimized in terms of its environment, health, and safety properties. But the structure property similarity principle this particular characteristic of the library being optimized in terms of, of the sustainability properties has consequences on the molecular structures that we have selected. And this is illustrated in, the, in this plot. This, this plot is a principal component plot that compares 96 structural features for the set of traditional solvents, and it compares with the set of uh, inchemia solvents. Each dot in the plot corresponds to one solvent. Red dots are traditional solvents, uh, the, the, the most used traditional solvents. The blue dots are inchemia solvents in the inchemia library. Now, according to the similarity principle, uh, the set of green chemicals should display similar properties than traditional the, the, the traditional set of chemicals, those with, in principle, undesired EHS profiles, um, in order to keep the functional variables. We will talk later what, what is it, but you, you now feel, feel uh, that, that the functional variables is uh, those that determine the efficacy of, of the chemical product doing the function, accomplishing the function. 
So in order to keep the functional variables within bounds of efficacy, so any alternative, any chemical structure should not depart um, uh, largely from the original structures. However, by the same similarity principle uh, that states that, the states that the chemical structure of the green alternatives should be significantly distant from the traditional set if we want to get rid of the, from the uh, hazardous properties. And this is a fundamental conflict between properties that we need to carefully manage. Otherwise, the similarity principle may pose important barriers for, for, for use and, and ultimately for, for market penetration of the greener alternatives. So you can see in the, in the plot how the majority of solvents lie close to the x-axis, which is the first principal component. This reflects a similarity of properties, meaning that all our liquids may be similar polarities, similar functional groups, similar connectivity indices, similar topological indices, and all the features that, um, that um, characterize this molecular structure. However, you can see that there's a clear distinction in the distribution of red dots versus the blue dots, the traditional versus the uh, in Kenya, with only a small overlapping region. So there is a difference, but not much difference. So in essence, we would say a good library should exploit small molecular structural differences to maximize the absence of hazardous properties while keeping the functional properties as close as possible to the to the uh, traditional set. Now this is this is just a comparison uh, uh, of the traditional solvents library with the Inchemia solvent library according to the column model in terms of the health hazard. So now how the distribution of solvents in the in Kimia library, um, uh, the plot at the right of your screen, is, is predicted centered on the negligible low category. It's the, the blue and, and the green sectors. This is compared to, to traditional the tra traditional solvents were almost three quarters of the of the of all of them uh, fall on the moderate to high to very high hazardous levels. So um, here is a part uh, that summarizes the distribution of solvents in. In, in the other uh, uh, categories of impact, like the uh, aquatic toxicity, uh, the VOC, emission potential, flammability, and, and occupational exposure. So. Now, let me, let me introduce at this point um, so some examples of application of the Inchemia, uh, or the Inchemia library to solve um, a, a number of, of uh, industrial problems. And we will come back uh, later on uh, with, um, with more uh, theoretical grounds and information, just linking so the, the, the function and um, and diversity. But let, let us now focus on examples of application. Let's see the library in action. Uh, so I, I, this is the first K. This is a cosmetic challenge. Uh, this is this is the goal of the project was to find a safer solvent for for a rinse off cosmetic formulation. Um, the formulation uh, had to meet seven functional requirements 
and, and sustainability requirements. So the functional specification was the formulation had to be had to be transparent uh, uh, in the blend. Uh, the solvent had to solubilize a hard to dissolve ingredient. The evaporation rate had to be in a narrow window of the specifications. And the interfacial tension, uh, the water oil interfacial tension, uh, was to be higher than a threshold. And also very important in cosmetic, but also in other, in other areas, uh, the solvent had to be odorless. Uh, the sustainability constraints uh, have the environmental impact uh, negligible or low, and the human safety parameters are uh, also negligible or low, according to the column model, the global harmonized system. So the most important thing here um, uh, let me let me say first uh, another constraint uh, from from the company we worked uh, for this project was was uh, that they gave us an exclusion list. Uh, an exclusion list means uh, they their team, their R and D team, had already tested 24 solvent candidates, but no one was was achieving the the right efficacy, or they were not satisfying complete the complete set of the seven constraints, the functional constraints and then EHA's requirements. The cost is always an issue in terms of industrial um, uh, use. And uh, also we were told to be, you know, to take into account uh, cost uh, issues. And um, so to so we started to to look at the library, um, and we just uh, made a feasibility study first, whether the library uh, can can is appropriate to find optimal solutions. And when I say optimal solutions, means satisfying the whole set of functional variables simultaneously. So finding a chemical, finding a solvent out of the 300 or more solvents that fulfills the whole set of uh, constraints, functional constraints. So we use a, like a, ser a search algorithm that allows us uh, not to predict, not to predict function because it is too complex, uh, but allows us to uh, do an efficient search in in a library that contains uh, several hundreds uh, of, of, of possibilities of candidates, right? Now we will, I, I am introducing here a, 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 a plot uh, uh, where, where we calculate in our evaluation of the, of the library, whether it is, it is um, appropriate to solve the, the problem. Uh, so we calculate what we call satisfiability probabilities, which is which is how, how probable is to find a, a, a chemical in, in the library that, that uh, satisfies the, false, the whole set of uh, seven uh, parameters. We will, we will uh, talk uh, 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 later on uh, on this probability. Let us let us uh, advance. Um, let us advance through the example, and and say that uh, so we, we we measured in in the laboratory uh, certain parameters uh, related to the solubility. So uh, solubility of uh, of the ingredients was perhaps the most the, the tougher of all the uh, requirements. Um, 
but also the evaporation rate, the interfacial tension, which is related with spreadability, was, was an, an issue. And, and uh, the way we work is, is by, by narrowing down the, uh, the, the, the diversity, narrowing down uh, uh, to a small set of candidates where we conduct uh, even more uh, uh, complex or more cost um, uh, um, experimental work. So that's, that's a, a plot of um, approaching the targets and, and this finally we could be able to uh, find um, two optimal solvents uh, that were successful in meaning that they were um, optimal in terms in terms of function and, and the environmental were sufficiently good in terms of, of human health and environmental constraints. Um, oh, well, this is this is a plot that let's let's say for for the moment that the satisfiability probability we calculated was was around 17 percent so it was very low probability um, um, of success and and we will we will uh, talk a bit more on on this uh, on this probability on the mathematics uh, of this but uh, that that means the how difficult is uh, finding the, the solution and it's a measure of how fitted. So if you find optimals in, with a certain library at such low probability, it means uh, means it is it is uh, it has a, a very good fit for the particular problem for solving the particular problem. Well. Well, this is the summary. Well, we solved, we were able to solve one of the hardest solvability problems. Um, the, the odorless and, and transparent solvent conferred very good spreadability the formulation, and we were able to reduce the health hazard, with, which was one of the main drivers uh, for, this, for this project. Now, uh, I would like to... Uh, Talk about uh, a second project that we, uh, where we use the, the, the solvent library, um, also in a cosmetic formulation. In this case, the problem or the uh, the request from the company was the replacement of a flammable solvent in in, in a skin care formulation. So in this case, the solvent uh, had to meet. Uh, simultaneously, uh, 10 functional regulatory and EHF requirements. So you can see here uh, everything from, from the solubility of the ingredients, um, uh, turbidity and phase separation should not appear after, you know, the, the, the three freeze, freeze zones cycles, no crystallization, no discoloration uh, at high temperature, uh, um, good long-term stability of the solvent, uh, uh, even at high temperatures. Uh, it had to be, this is an, a requirement uh, that is more regulatory rather than scientific or technological. It should be in fee registered. Um, this means it should be commercially available. Cost was also a, an issue and uh, human health hazard, environmental hazard, and, and also, in this case, physical hazard was the issue. Total 10, 10 uh, functional variables and AHS variables that had to be within narrow windows of the specifications. We had to find a solvent meeting that large number of specifications. Well, just a, a, a few just a few um, um, slides on, on the uh, um, details of the research. This was a freeze, freeze the cycle. Uh, so it was minus 10 to 20, minus 10 to 20, minus 10 to 20. 
uh, and after this cycle, no crystallization, no turbidity, uh, no, nothing. It was stability. Uh, uh, stability was an issue at this point. So, uh, out of the of the larger library, fourteen solvents were initially selected uh, under the criteria of maximum structural diversity. Um, you can see after after the freeze zone cycle, we had we had all kind of behavior here. So we had transparency, which is the good thing to happen. We had uh, solvents that uh, caused turbidity or phase separation to appear, and uh, also other solvents uh, um, uh, caused crystallization of, of the ingredients too. Now, uh, the long-term stability uh, test was, was 1,000 hours at 50 degrees. And no discoloration in this case had to uh, had to happen. Um, so we had um, no discoloration, nor hydrolysis of the solvent would occur uh, on such uh, a test. And we had, um, you know, from the 14 samples, we had a diversity of results, which reflect the diversity, the chemical diversity that we used. So everything from yellowing. Uh, different shades of that yellowing. Also, we we got hydrolysis of, of solvent in um, um, in in one case. So so within the the set uh, we identi we identified an optimal solvent that enabled the formulation of uh, of the cosmetic product. Uh, uh, satisfying the 10 functional specifications and uh, but also the, the results obtained with the first set of 14 allowed us to compute the probability of finding additional optimal solvents uh, possibly with with better secondary properties secondary characteristics and this is this is an important thing so you might ask why did you start by a number or evaluating 14 solvents right, in this case and not 20 or 5. So the reason is because, because we, we figured out what are the probabilities, uh, what are the loss probability uh, governing the, um, the search, the process of searching um, chemicals that fulfill simultaneously the N, the 10, in this case, the 10 functional parameters. And we know that by full, that by evaluating 14 solvents, uh, we could be able to, uh, to get uh, a very high probability, like 75% probability. And that was good enough, but it, it would be, um, the cure, the theoretical cure, um, uh, indicated us that we could maybe find uh, uh, um, more solvents that are were um, satisfying, that were optimal, and we proceeded. So we we went to uh, so we analyzed up to forty seven. So we add more solvents to the for, for, to the initial solvent set, and we set uh, of 14 up to 47 solvents. So and this this is the 47, a collection of 47 that we evaluated. Uh, we and this this is this is how it turns that the, the, the we found finally two optimal solvents, uh, one found in the first set of 14 and the other solvent, which was structurally different, uh, significantly different, uh, had the same function, functional performance by uh, the functional state. Um, so, so we end up uh, with two solutions, and, um, 
and we could uh, find a, a better compromise in terms in terms of efficacy and cost in this case. Another uh, another uh, case that I would like to bring here is the uh, metal degreasing. It's, this is about metal degreasing. We 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 wanted a replacement for trichloroethylene for the degreasing of sinterized metal parts. This is by immersion and, and uh, ultrasonication, and, and and so we we had just a number of of, um, of functional constraints, and uh, again, so we the goal was um, sinterized uh, metal parts were extremely difficult uh, um, for the uh, the greasing because these are porous metal uh, materials. So you have the grease uh, well deep into the pores, and it's it's difficult to 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 degrease. And and industrially they they are using um, ultrasonication techniques. So the that's so we we used uh, um, the the library. We found um, an optimal solvent. Um, In this case, uh, it was it was a, a levolinator. So we we find we ultimately uh, filed a patent of of this um, of this application. And this here you can see um, what happens when the if efficacy of the greasing is not good. Uh, so the metal piece gets a dark color, and this is this is not good. Um, again, and here we could um, compare the the satisfiability probability of the Inkemia uh, library, uh, the Inkemia solvent library, and compared to uh, an analogous uh, set of the same size of traditional solvents. So you see the, if you can see the red red dot in the middle of, of the density plot. Um, uh, it corresponds to a probability of 0.06, well, 6%, 6-7%, while the satisfiability probability of the Inkemia library was on the on this uh, 65%. So in this case, uh, we found three three solvent uh, uh, three solvents with excellent removal efficiencies for the grease uh, in uh, under ultra ultrasonication conditions, um, the low vapor of the solvent will make them suitable for immersion or spray oven systems. The operating procedure involves the recovery, reutilization of the solvent, and um, it, it, it brought uh, uh, safety to, to the place, to the working place. That was, that was good. And um, and I think this is the the last case I, I wanted to comment, uh, and and this is um, um, this is a marine paint formulation. In this case, the replacement. So the the idea and the goal here was reducing the VOC content of of a marine paint formulation. Um, uh, so we the strategy here was to uh, select an non-VOC reactive diluent um, uh, in order to replace partially uh, the uh, solvent endowment of the formula. Uh, here the functional specifications were the uh, everything that matters in the paint and coating industry uh, which is uh, and formulations which is viscosity, film formation and leveling, the appearance, uh, calorimetric stability, no yellowing, drying time, the, the hardness, the quality and the hardness of the coating once in the surface, uh, the gloss addition to metals and boot, uh, and also chemical resistance. So there were, we had to meet uh, all those uh, functional performances and also uh, health and, 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 and VOC, um, the environmental uh, health uh, issues. Now here, just, just details of the experimental, and so we were comparing 
the uh, formulation, the formula with the solvent, uh, the traditional solvent, which was a white spirit, uh, versus the um, uh, versus the solvent uh, used by Inkemia, which was a reactive dilute. Here we, was, we can see how how viscosity could be could be um, comparable. Uh, also, the hardness was comparable and, and acceptable. Um, uh, the good film formation, good film formation and leveling was was observed. So the appearance of of this of the coating was was very similar to the benchmark. Um, uh, same as the gloss, there's a little a little uh, increase in gloss that could be corrected with mating agents. Like you can, uh, you could, you, you, you were able to accommodate a deviation of, of the gloss uh, by adjusting other ingredients of the formulation. Um, there was a, a very good adherence and substrate according to the uh, standard um, methods for, for measuring this, these properties. And um, and also uh, we found similar chemical resistance um, at the end of the of the evaluation project, um, and uh, no yellowing uh, was observed. So it, it had good stability upon exposure to to the to the ambient. Um, so here, see as uh, it was uh, not. Uh, uh, as easy as other uh, as other projects uh, with a probability of around 10 30 percent so we were able uh, able to find one uh, optimal ingredient um, so that is the summary that we already have uh, shown and uh, well actually there's this is an example from from agrochemical I think it's it's uh, rapid enough to um, to uh, to go through it um, here the um, the problem or the target was uh, the replacement of a uh, aromatic hydrocarbons right non BOC safer solvents so um, in particular we wanted to replace the Solveso 100 which is a mixture of chylene toluene and other aromatic hydrocarbons so the solvent here had to be uh, um, Good uh, should display uh, a good solvent hydraulic stability because uh, the emulsion and, and, and water, um, uh, good chemical compatibility, uh, emulsion stability, and, and uh, all the uh, the functional uh, properties like leave coverage uh, and when applied to the to the crops, um, an active ingredient uptake, uh, and and should display selective phytotoxicity. So kill kill the the the, the bad plan, but not not kill the crop. Uh, also, the sustainability constraints, health and environmental impact was was considered. Um, so the active ingredient uh, so was a, a class of the uh, port, proto porphyrinogen oxidase inhibitors. It's a class of, of herbicides. Um, and uh, so we, the the company here, we collaborated with uh, Isagro Ricerca in Italy. So they they performed greenhouse experiments, but also field experiments. And here is the difference uh, of when you treat the crop and and without treatment on on the right on the lower right um, of the of the photograph. Um, so the efficacy was was very good, and here here we had the we had the probability of 63 uh, percent. We could replace aromatic hydrocarbons uh, with a long alkyl chain um, esters, uh, specifically lactic acid esters, um, which is remarkably different structurally different from from the aromatic hydrocarbons but it worked 
it worked nice and and the company filed, filed a patent uh, on on the formulation so we were it was uh, it, it, it was uh, an interesting um, um, uh, thing um, I would like just to finalize um, just to um, make you uh, aware of a little bit of, of our methodology so, so we have talked about chemicals and functions um, um, so for uh, functions functions in in, in it, it's for for the application chemist means means all those things that we have already seen uh, uh, in a cosmetic formula could be everything from density viscosity stability uh, related to formulation but also uh, things related to the application like, like appearance applicability of rheology uh, in in any industrial applications you always find a number of relatively large number of functional parameters which must be within bounds um, so so the thing is um, so um, how to um, how to uh, keep the function how to keep the function in a in a process of solvent replacement, um, so uh, w when when it is it is for the similarity principle, it is uh, very probable that if you are using uh, uh, yeah just one solvent, you you are going to get you know um, many or, or, or one or more of the functional parameters out of specifications. Right, you can do, you can do adjustments of the of the formulation in order to accommodate uh, a, a new uh, green alternative, but that uh, not always works. And uh, and the basic message I would like to give you is is to make sure you have uh, the you know the right diversity and and the right size of your of your um, ensemble of, of, of solvent candidates uh, to make the trials. Um, I think that's that's the basic message. Uh, I, I don't want to go into much detail. Would like to to finish at this point, and um, just to say that uh, we have been uh, say um, introducing uh, probabilities and uh, statistical uh, uh, and. and you know probability notion, and um, and this was, we have been able to to understand uh, profoundly uh, these probabilities just by measuring all the functional parameters, even if we know we already know that one of the functional variables was uh, out of the specifications, so we continue measuring uh, in our past research work all the functional specifications and we were able to to get you know a sense of what are the probability what are the uh, possibilities you know in terms of probability you, to make a probability statement you have to know what is the space of, pos of possibilities the total possibilities and then you can make probability statements. This is something we don't use, we're not used to do, because in the application laboratory, uh, once you know that uh, a solvent does not fulfill an important uh, functional variable, you discard it immediately. But you're missing information uh, in order to make probability statements. So we. We try to understand all, all these uh, probabilities, and, and, and this is the idea that just I, I wanted to, to, uh, to bring to your attention because I think it's important um, uh, to have a, a, good, um, a good approach in terms of, of diversity making, uh, uh, being able to make probability statements. And, and I think the, this is all on my side and uh, probably I, I spoke too much today. I uh, would like to pass the word to Laura and, and to the audience uh, 
uh, and I will be happy to answer any questions that uh, might arise. Great, thank you so much, Carlos. Um, so yeah, that was a fascinating presentation. Um, so for those of you, um, I do see a few questions have come in, but um, for those of you that um, have not uh, submitted questions, please, um, if you do have any questions for Carlos, there is a question box um, off to the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and if I could only get it to open, I could, there we go. Um, Yes, so if you do have any more questions, um, please do submit them. Um, so let me go with the first question. Um, so as I understand it, your model predicts a set of workable or optimal solvent solutions. Can you synthesize all of them in your lab for bench testing for clients' lab application? So uh, that question is just about, um, you know, okay, so you have predicted there are many possible options. Um, but are you actually able to synthesize those? Let's say you predict a really great model molecule. Um, can you make it in your lab? Um, yes, Lauren. Um, Laura, yes, uh, uh, you're right. That we, we can uh, we can uh, synthesize. We we have uh, capabilities and um, organic chemistry uh, uh, laboratories. And actually, this is this is the the job and the work we have done over over the past uh, decades uh, is being um, synthesizing uh, uh, in collaboration with with other laboratories, uh, universities, uh, chemical companies uh, in a number of projects. So we've been able to to do a, a synthetic um, effort here. Uh, but uh, also we, we are using existing existing chemicals that uh, that are excellent uh, in terms of environmental health and safety, uh, and we join, we we combine you know the two the two sources. Uh, so we, we our, our mission is to grow the largest possible uh, uh, green chemical library. Um, in this case, um, we're talking about solvents. Um, um, so th that's that's our mission, and um, we we are um, con in a continuous effort um, on, on that direction. Great. Um, and actually, one of the the next questions is um, a good follow up question, I think, um, for that. So, um, as you're working with the clients. Um, you know, to solve a problem. Once you identify a solvent um, solution for for that client, um, and it's not commercially available, you know, what are possible next steps? So certainly, you can you can synthesize in your lab, but how would you how would you make it at scale? Well, right. Th this is a, an important issue um, that we we have uh, committed to uh, to um, try to develop um, the. Um, all the required steps to make a commercial reality at large scale, any optimal solution that we found in our in our um, uh, work uh, for, with with companies. Um, so the thing is, when you when a chemical is not commercially available, that means um, that means that you you cannot have in your hands um, quickly. Now, what it means is, depending on the registration process of the chemical, uh, depending on the uh, manufacturing uh, uh, systems that are required, so it will take uh, it will take from three months to uh, to maybe one year, a year and a half. To, to reach the market. Um, I, I mean, the w w what we believe is is a chemical that is safe and that it works deserves the maximum effort. I mean, th this is this is one thing, and we are committed to make uh, commercial realities uh, anything that we find useful and that it's it has uh, 
very interesting sustainability properties. So in this direction, we work. Um, so we have a, a, a network of contacts uh, on, the, on in chemical companies, uh, chemical manufacturers, everything from from uh, we we operate uh, our, uh, our plants like a small plants for for uh, generating uh, a relatively small amounts of of, um, of chemicals. Um, uh, that means we, we can we operate um, uh, pilot plants on the 500 liter reaction uh, scale. Uh, also, we have uh, we have contact with uh, contract manufacturers, um, and um, and we we have uh, industrial partnerships uh, for future development of, of new chemistries. Okay, great. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's always a, a big question when you're developing new chemistries, but it sounds like you have a really good network to make that happen. Um, so uh, another question from a an, um, another uh, person that tuned in um, is asking um, about, uh, you know, about using um, renewable, re, uh, renewable chemicals. Um, so they're interested in um, if the chemicals that you use are based on renewable resources, or are they uh, petroleum based? Um, so I guess that's yeah. the first part of their question is, you know, do you, do you typically go for um, petroleum based feedstocks or do you have a preference for bio based or is that kind of more based on the client? Uh, yeah, that, that is, um, uh, so any source of, of good chemicals is good for us. <laughs> So as far as far as you can have uh, um, a well, you know, well-defined chemical in terms of you know satisfying the environmental health and safety constraints, that is a, an amazing achievement. Whether it comes from oil or renewable origin, uh, it it is. It is. It matters to us because um, uh, it matters to us as long as we can demonstrate uh, that you have an advantage in terms of, of life cycle uh, analysis. Like uh, we have been in in several projects on on making products, chemical products, uh, out of renewables, and. Uh, and we've been performing uh, a life cycle analysis, and it, it is not straightforward that you can get a good life cycle analysis uh, from uh, renewable. So there are renewable feedstocks where we have been able to, to have a, a good product with the right life cycle analysis. Uh, sometimes this has not been possible. So we, we need to we need to take care. But in in over the past years, the there has been in the green chemistry community uh, a lot of effort to uh, to bring to market uh, renewable chemicals. And for us, it is an it is an amazing approach uh, if we can combine renewables, good life cycle, and um, and good environmental health and safety properties, mm -hmm. that will be the ideal situation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I think that's the that's the goal that many people are certainly striving for. Um, that would be. That would be now we have we have uh, just in this direction. Uh, I would like to that we are making lots of efforts to to get to introduce in in the in the libraries. Um, like algae oil derivatives. So we have found a source of very cheap algae oil that uh, it's hard to believe because uh, because all engineers in the world tells you that algae oil is is very expensive to produce. Uh, but we are we are now uh, uh, you know finalizing contracts with with uh, with with Asian partners that uh, they told us that they found 
or cheap way to to make that. So so we're we're in, in a broad interest. We have all, all our antennas uh, looking at whatever uh, is coming uh, from from the renewals uh, um, space and 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 hoping to introduce as much as possible into into the commercial um, into the commercial world. Absolutely, and I think uh, too. Whenever you start from um, different feedstocks, then that gives you access to different functionalities, and um, you know maybe possibility for different structures that were not previously accessible. So uh, certainly, I think it's a good place to go mining for new molecules. Um, uh, another question um, that's coming in here, and I apologize because probably we won't be able to get to all the questions. I realize we're after the hour, um, so if we don't get to your question, I apologize. Um, but uh, so. I guess maybe this is a quick one, but um, is there information publicly available about the types of, of molecular structures that are in your library? Um, or, you know, what kind of information do you disclose publicly? Well, it, it's coming. It's coming soon. Okay. <laughs> um, we have, uh, so uh, the, the, you know, the tool, so we, we treat as, a, as an internal tool, the, you know, the, the whole library. Um, um, but we are now uh, in very soon we're going to make uh, uh, part of the library public uh, so so you will have all, all all the information even you you can have access to physical access to uh, getting the 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 solvents and and the chemicals um, you know uh, from the internet um, so uh, we are very happy about that, but maybe it's not the moment to to announce because this is not official. Maybe maybe uh, uh, um, I, I should stop talking, but but uh, <laughs> but the answer is yes. Uh, we we are going to to have a significant portion of of the chemistry's public. Well, that's great. I I will look forward to looking at that whenever whenever it does become public. Um, so another question um, is: Have you found some traditional solvents to be acceptable, um, you know, screening through your column model? So some of the some of the already existing chemistries, um, you know, have you found some that that are already actually pretty good? Well, yes. Um, there there are um, there are. Um, Many, uh, I would say. Um, so we, you can you can have, for instance, uh, um, dimethyl carbonate. You can you can have esters, uh, fatty acid derivatives. Um, there are there are um, not not a good uh, you know a massive amount uh, uh, because you you know you know the the. Um, the proportions of, of the, the low hazard uh, um, in in place uh, they are not the most abundant uh, but um, yeah there are a number of, of, of possibilities you and you will you will see when it's uh, when it's public uh, that uh, that how many um, good options are commercially available maybe maybe um, you are not going to find uh, quick, quickly uh, uh, a replacement for dichloromethane because of the unique properties. Um, but we have been able to to replace NMP in certain in certain uh, um, in certain uh, applications, such as a reaction solvent for for fine chemicals production. So, for instance. We have been able to replace um, uh, N-methylpyrrolidone by th by uh, a glycerol car glycerol carbonate. You know, it's it's unbelievable how how different are the chemicals, but they are bring they are bringing the same function. And and this is a, this is a, an important concept when thinking about replacements. Think about the function rather than matching the physical chemical properties and this is I think this is uh, the main message uh, uh, that we can give to to the green chemist practitioner 
Yeah, absolutely. That is that's a very important message. Um, that if you if you are looking for alternatives, obviously function is what what matters most. Um, so okay, so I think the uh, last question that we'll have time for today, because uh, we're already ten minutes past the hour, um, is uh, you know kind of like a high level question. But how does your lab inform or influence, if at all, a client's initial sustainability parameters, such as the scope or metrics? of hazardous solvents, um, for example, in this relationship between the lab and client, who is who is it that's defining the toxicity? Right. Well, many times, uh, th this is interesting, uh, many times we, we, uh, we get the, the same, uh, the same question. So, so what, what, what is a green chemical for you? I have, I have heard uh, a lot of uh, definitions and, and and people is uh, sometimes we, we we find that they are lost. I mean a little bit on on, on what what to so um, so we are uh, totally um, um, systematic in in this in this area. So um, so we, we have we we have um, the global harmonized system. We want to have the maximum number of um, endpoints uh, in the safe domain, uh, and and that's that's the the most important um, the most important concept. With being in general, our interaction with clients so far, um, so what we we get is 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 people want to have uh, and to launch. Um, ambitious projects. So, so the so the the ambitious projects means so uh, for instance, um, I don't want flammability. Uh, I don't want VOC. I, I want VOC exemptions. Uh, I want high evaporation rate. So the so people is is demanding very ambitious properties of solvents and i think i think the the challenge for 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 us is to react to such and such ambitious demand yeah um yeah thank you yeah no i think that's a that's a good point is um you know depending on, on what they're asking for. Um, sometimes it can be quite ambitious, but uh, it seems like you have a really broad library to, to be able to address that. Um, so uh, I am, unfortunately, we're going to have to stop um, with questions right now. Uh, we're almost 15 past the hour, so um, apologies again if your question didn't, uh, didn't get addressed. But um, you're certainly welcome to contact us, um, and we can put you in touch with Carlos uh, to, to ask any follow-up questions. Um, so. I just wanted to um, announce just really quickly an event that the GC3 has going on um, in Boston. This will be uh, the day before the Green Build event. We have a, a networking event the evening before, um, which is at the UMass Club um, on the 32nd floor uh, in downtown Boston. So it's got great views of the skyline. Um, and so at this event, um, so this is focused on um, the building product sector. So uh, we'll be bringing together GC3 member companies and others interested in um, green building products. Uh, and part of the event will actually feature some uh, some startup companies talking about their uh, their companies and technologies that have uh, applications in the building sector. So if you do plan on coming to Green Builds, um, you will please feel free. Uh, if you're interested in attending, please email us at gc3info at greenchemistryandcommerce.org. So um, I just want to say thank you again for joining us, um, and thank you so much to Carles for speaking. Um, I, I really enjoyed learning about uh, the fascinating combination um, of, you know, of math and computational chemistry and statistics that Inkemia uses to try to find green chemistry solutions for um, many different applications. So again, thank you, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much.